to 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 and I'm reading to you from verse 13 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 13 but I would not have you to be ignorant brethren it's talking to brothers and sisters it's talking to members of the family of God those who are born again those who are children of God, washed and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, brothers and sisters, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, ye mourn not, ye grow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe, thank God I believe. I say, thank God I believe. For if we believe, that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this was say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain until the coming, until the coming of the Lord shall not proceed, shall not hinder shall not prevent them which are asleep, which are dead. For the Lord himself, not an angel, the Lord himself, not one of the prophets that died, for the Lord himself, Jesus Christ, shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be cut up. That's the rapture. The word rapture you'll not find in the Bible. There's some people that they say, show me that word in the Bible. Actually, you're going to find a lot of things that a lot of words you may not find in the Bible. For example, the word Bible itself. In the Greek, Biblia, the books, a library of books, 66 books. You'll not find that word Bible in the Bible. And yet we know this is the Holy Bible. The word Trinity you'll not find in your Bible. But we know that Jesus said, You baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the Son, and the love of God, that's the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, be with you all. The teaching is there, but you don't find the word Trinity there. And so the word rapture actually is a Latin word. It means being cut up. Those who have died in Christ, they will be raised incorruptible. And those who are still alive, like you and I, if you're a believer, if you're a child of God, if you're saved, washed, and cleansed in the blood of the Lamb, it says, we shall be caught up, that's the rapture, together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. To meet the Lord in the air. There are people that confuse the rapture with the second coming. When Christ comes the second time, which is referred to as the second coming of Christ. He will not stay in the air. He will come to the earth here. And his feet will touch Mount Olivet. That's the second coming. That's after the rapture. That's after the great tribulation. But before the great tribulation, the rapture, 
we will meet the Lord not on a mountain, but in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I'll be there. Where are you? I said, I will be there. You'll be there in Jesus' name. He says, wherefore, if you're a believer, wherefore, if you're a child of God, wherefore, if you're a member of the body of Christ, comfort one another with these words. I want to ask you a question. How do you respond to the teaching of the rapture of the church? I'm talking to you this morning on proper response to Christ's return. Proper response to Christ's return. The people, when they hear about the rapture, about the coming of Christ again, they are passive. Passive, that means no action, no action taken. And they are lethargic, they look warm. They are inactive. And I want to ask you, as you hear about the rapture, the return of Christ, are you passive? Number two, there are people who are pensive. They are tensed up. They are afraid. They are disturbed. Because they know that if Christ should come, they are not ready. They have not repented. Or maybe they repented before. They're backsliding. They're living in a hidden sin, secret sin, cherished sin. And it's so heavy on their heart. Every time they hear Christ is coming, Christ is coming, they're pensive. And it's like, will he come? Is he coming now? I've not made my way right. I've not done the necessary restitution. Restoration. I have not come fully unto the Lord. I don't think I'm ready. And because of that, they are pensive and sad and anxious and fearful and frightened and disturbed. Some are passive about you. Others are pensive about you. Thank God. Others, number three, are positive. They're practical, they're active, they're preparing, they're hopeful. Christ may come today, glad day, glad, glad day. And I will see my friend, my savior. I will see him, the one who loves me so much. And he died for me, glad day, glad day shall Christ come today. Positive. And you want to determine your own response to the coming of the Lord. As you look at this stop subject, proper response to Christ's return, you open to Titus chapter 2. Proper response, Christ is coming. You respond positively, not being passive or pensive. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness, you have to have the grace of God in you and the strength of God in you that will say no to Satan. No to sin, no to temptation, and no to all the society around you in the world, and no to all those bad habits that were picked up in your sinful days. Because the grace of God comes in after you have repented, you are born again, you are a child of God, and it teaches us that denying ungodliness. And worldly lost, we should live how? Frivolously, carelessly, like a jester, a clown in society. It's superficial, never having an attitude of seriousness. But here the people are dying. 
but people might hurt, might hear. The Christ is coming, might hear. The judgment day is coming. Are you ready for that day when it comes? They're still superficial and careless. They never think about their never dying souls, about where they will spend eternity. But it says, it teaches us that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. Where? Tell me out loud. The people that tell us we cannot be godly now, the world is so sinful. Our depravity is so deep and is so entrenched in us. We cannot live a righteous life, a holy life, a godly life. But it says, the grace of God comes in. And we live soberly, righteously. And we live godly in this present world. Look at verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope. We prepare. We respond properly. We respond positively. We respond with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, wanting to serve the Lord, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify, that sanctification, purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Proper response to Christ's return. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, purposeful preparation for the rapture. Purposeful preparation for the rapture. Number two, perplexing peril at his return. When he returns, either for the rapture or for the second coming, either the first appearance or the second advent, there's going to be perplexity and peril, pain, danger for the people who are lost, for the people who do not make it at the time of the rapture. Number three, preeminent or predominant priority of the righteous. Preeminent priority of the righteous. You're thinking about Christ's return. You're thinking about the rapture. You're thinking about the fulfillment of prophecies concerning the coming of Christ again. And you want to have preparation, proper response, so that you'll not miss out at that time. I pray you'll not miss out in Jesus' name. Number one, purposeful preparation for the rapture. I want to concentrate now on First Thessalonians. Something will probably surprise you and also will delight you. That this topic of the rapture is mentioned in every chapter of First Thessalonians. Chapter 1, chapter 2. Chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5. Not only that. It's mentioned at the end of every chapter. End of every chapter in 1 Thessalonians. Let's look at this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 8. It says, from, from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia. But also, in every place, your face, joy to God, word, is spread abroad, so that we need not speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we urge unto you. And now ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Look at this. And to wait for his son from heaven. Your father is coming? Yes, he's coming. How do you respond? To wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Chapter 2. In chapter 2, I'm reading the last two verses. Verses 19 and 20. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are ye not 
and not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. His coming. What will be the joy of the preacher? That the converts are abiding. The converts are faithful. And the converts remain until that time. For ye are our glory and joy. Chapter 3. In chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 11. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one to another and toward all men, even as we do toward you to the end for the purpose he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. You have the emphasis in every chapter. Come to chapter 4. Reading now from verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Chapter 5. In chapter 5 from verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto, until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. As uh, the Apostle Paul, by the inspiration of the Spirit of God, emphasizes and underscores and underlines the coming of Christ again, the rapture of the church, the rapture of the saints, when Christ shall come and take his beloved one home. He also emphasizes how we prepare, how we get ready. And these verses I've read to you, they show us the purposeful preparation for the rapture. Come back to chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 9 and verse 10. It says, for they themselves show of us. What manner of entering in we urge unto you, how ye turned to God from idols. That's salvation. That's salvation. You're waiting for the coming of the Lord. There must be salvation. How ye turned to God from idols to serve the living God, the true God. That's occupation. You're occupied. Occupy until I come. Number one, how do you get ready? How do you prepare? For the coming of the Lord. It says, number one, the salvation. You turn to God from all your idols. Number two, there's occupation. Number three, there's